Hello, I'm Jennifer Bishop, 2009 Doctor of Science graduate at the Harvard Chan School, current member of the Alumni Weekend Committee, and president of the DC area alumni chapter, residing in Virginia. Each year during the Alumni Weekend, we have an opportunity to listen to lightning talks from fellow alum. This year, the committee chose alumni to share stories about crisis response, especially amidst a global pandemic. Dr. Jeffrey Blander is a leapfrog innovator, strategic disruptor, and transformation specialist. Jeff believes in the transformative power of the public, private, and nonprofit sectors working together to reimagine sustainable financing for public health delivery systems, as well as timely, efficient, and equitable access to life saving services. Jeff is a three time graduate of the Harvard T.H. Chan School, receiving two Masters of Science in 2000 and 2004 in Health Policy Management and Society Human Development and Health, and in 2008, a Doctorate of Science in Society Human Development and Health. Jeff has over 25 years of professional experience and brings a unique perspective in shaping new ideas to tackle our biggest global challenges. His experience includes serving as the Chief Innovation Officer at the U.S. Department of State, supporting the battle against two pandemics for HIV AIDS and COVID-19. He's also a business executive, researcher, educator, foundation president, and his most treasured role is dad. Jeff, I hand it over to you. Jennifer, thank you so much for those kind words and to the committee and really our global alumni. I, I am really uh, so blessed to be here and have a, a few moments to share some thoughts during this uh, terrible pandemic and some of the work that I'm engaged in. And the title of this is called Innovation Matters and give a little context to some of the things that I do uh, during the day job and then uh, take you through and then some ideas of how we might work together as an alumni base in these challenging times. So uh, I joined uh, the PEPFAR President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief uh, about eight years ago, but the, the program has been going on for uh, 17 years. And it was started uh, during a State of the Union address then as an expression of, of compassion of the American people to end uh, this other terrible pandemic. And when PEPFAR began, for those of you who may go back and, and, and were around during these days professionally, really HIV was a death sentence. And this was a historic opportunity to, again, show not only compassion, but really take um, what was then un the unknown and now moving it and shifting it to now what is the impossible is now very much possible on a community by community basis. And since then, this historic program has saved more than 8 million lives and millions more in terms of preventing infection. And by working together with our partners in more than 50 countries, we've transformed this HIV pandemic from a crisis to now more of a control, again, working uh, within community by community and country by country. And the results really speak for themselves. And again, I just wanna share that everything that I'm, I'm discussing here is referenced in our annual reports or uh, country operating plan guidance. So feel free, you can download those. But really, if you see, you know, as of 2019, we can see just so many of the remarkable achievements that we've made, whether it's over 22 million uh, males uh, for voluntary uh, circumcision to prevent HIV in men and boys, uh, our work in adolescent girls and young women, where we've reduced uh, HIV uh, diagnosis by 25% or more, over 2.6 million babies born HIV free, and the list goes on in terms of uh, impacting positively our work with orphans and vulnerable children, over 6 million receive support. It's really a true uh, uh, blessing and privilege to be part of this amazing global program and family. In addition to those remarkable uh, statistics, 
Also, we can see uh, using the data, and we're a very data-driven program, that there are a number of countries that have made these dramatic declines in both deaths among HIV uh, positive individuals, as well as reduction in new infections. And here are several examples, including Zimbabwe, Kenya, Burundi, and again, these are taken from the uh, annual report to Congress. But this is really uh, belies the approach that we take, which is using data, not only at the aggregate, but really getting down to the minutia into subnational units at the site level. Uh, included in this remarkable uh, impact is also efficiency and that we've actually been able to expand prevention and treatment services with a flat budget since 2010. And I think that really shows the leadership and also the amazing uh, teamwork of partners and staff and those in the community of how do we become more efficient so that essentially we can uh, do more with the same or in some cases even less. So the challenge. We know that we're faced with this terrible uh, now second pandemic of COVID and PEPFAR is really a model long standing with this remarkable success of cultivating and scaling innovation since 2003. Some of these are game changing technologies or reformulations. Others are smaller scale incremental process or policies that have really culminated in helping to save over 18 million lives. And now with COVID, this pandemic, of course, it, it, it poses new challenges to our agency and field teams, but in many ways, this is the global community that if they can take on something in terms of resiliency and adaptation, this is the group and team and communities that can do it. And really the part of the challenge is because there's such a rapid pace of adapting and learning, how do we really look at this in a critical way so we can uh, meaningfully collect these experiences and share them? So pose the question, why, and if not now, when? And really it gets to the heart of, we don't wanna innovate for innovation's sake. What really we wanna focus on is strategic innovation to address key gaps. And on the earlier slide, there was a picture of the Earth uh, from the moon. And I always like to uh, put that out there as kind of a tongue in cheek example, because when I work in government, I spent many years outside of government in the private sector. And the view uh, at times sometimes is that, you know, innovation in government is an oxymoron. But if we think of some of the greatest innovations, whether that was a uh, landing, um, landing on the moon or now actually uh, finding and solving perhaps a new vaccine for COVID. These are all part of an ecosystem of public, private, government, private partnerships. But it's important to be strategic. So here's an example from our uh, PEPFAR guidance um, around uh, client-centered delivery. And this is a really good example of resiliency, adaptation, and innovation during COVID. Because even before COVID, we recognized that there were quite a few challenges around retaining clients across almost all our countries we work in, regardless of the level of the ARV coverage. But we know that to sustain epidemic control, it won't be reached or sustained if a large number of our clients don't stay on treatment. So we recognize as, as uh, PEPFAR that we must implement these strategies for continuous client-centered antiretroviral therapy. And so what does that mean? What does that translate into? It means how do we look at successfully retaining our clients as a lifelong strategy that's client-centered so that there's a health system that makes it possible, makes it easier for clients to retain on this, this treatment. And so with that said, we had already begun a process of de designing services and intervention that would help remove barriers, whether it was key populations, orphans and vulnerable children, adolescent young girls and women, young men. Um, and here within the context of COVID, how do we now really think in a, in a, in a responsive way 
where in a lot of cases, some countries where traditional services had shut down, facilities were not um, engaging clients as they traditionally would. And this is a key area of innovation. So what I'm going to now uh, discuss a little bit is our framework. So how do we define and apply the innovation? So the innovation itself, it could be a technology, right? And as I mentioned before, it could be a reformulation of, uh, of, a, of a drug a cocktail, perhaps for uh, pediatric or children, or it could be something new for adults where it perhaps might be something where you uh, need to take less pills over time. Uh, one area would be multi-month dispensing, so you don't have to return to the facility as often, but perhaps maybe every six months. And partner models, what are new partners? Are there new sources of funding, financing from the private sector to really make one plus one equal three? And then what are some of the policies that we may have to examine in this case around perhaps public and private? Can you access the same resources so that you can provide the same effective treatment to clients in the communities where they are. And what's important is looking at an innovation framework around these ideas, because as you would imagine in a global community of over uh, uh, 54 countries we work in, representing thousands of staff and implementation partners and the clients and those that we uh, serve within the communities, you need to have a way of really um, triaging. So, of course, here is a, a framework around the paper napkin phase. How do you create an idea and how do you work for, uh, together? I really like to call this the kitchen sink moment. And that uh, initial go, no go. How do you mobilize? Is it worth, do, does this really warrant mobilizing new resources to effectuate? And then, it's not just that, it's also how do you reward staff? How do you recognize them for coming up with not only ideas that quite frankly make it to that stage, but there are things that we call successful failures where they may have come up with a new idea, may not be something that we move forward with, but still that recognition of, of creativity and energizing beyond the bounds or lanes that they're in. And then what's so important, we all know about pilot-itis, uh, the idea that how do you scale something? Because you may have a successful pilot, but if you really can't generalize it or it, you can't use it beyond that specific context, quite frankly, it may not um, be something of great value. So we really take pride in that early on of how do we assess that potential. And then again, as part of this, that kind of go, no go, not only scale it, um, but how do we get the teams who actually developed it involved so it really becomes an organic process? So see some key questions around this as we uh, wrap up our, our discussion here is, given this rapid pace of, of change, how and in what way can we best authentically share ideas? How do we create safe spaces to facilitate learning? What are the technologies or methods that we can use to facilitate or strengthen South to South? And so uh, a process that we've done, while it sounds perhaps rather basic, is really something that was organically uh, addressed and demanded by those that we work with was, you know, as a part of what we call these global calls home that we have several times a month with uh, staff around the world in the over 50 countries we work in and typically on average we have over 250 or more who join is having an opportunity to listen and not necessarily be uh, uh, fearful to bring up ideas or it has to be absolutely in tune with guidance that is is codified from the last uh, country operating plan but really talk about how they're adopting in the field so how are they using technologies webex or mobile phones around how do we engage clients who aren't able to come to the facilities? How do we address this youth bulge around uh, engaging adolescent uh, young uh, girls, women, as well as boys? How do we use text messaging? How do we use things that normally we might have been face to face, but quite frankly, aren't capable of um, in some countries right now? And then what is the process of understanding that so that we can analyze it and then share it and then absorb it into our regular business process 
so that again, if there is the there there and it's justified by the data, that actually we can embrace it and scale it and it could be, become part of our DNA. And so as I wrap up here, I know I've been talking about a very distinct and succinct area which I work in, which is PEPFAR and addressing the HIV pandemic in the context of COVID. But again, feeling so blessed and privileged to be part of this amazing community of alumni. And I, I end with, we are in this together and how are we reimagining a, 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 a better tomorrow? And a couple of my favorite quotes where Albert Einstein said, logic will get you from A to Z, but imagination will get you everywhere. And I know that as part of our background, I, I also did my, my doctorate at the School of Public Health where it's grounded in science, it's grounded in epi, it's grounded in biostats. That's part of it. But also sometimes we have to take those numbers and embrace them in the context of communities that are people engaged to think outside the box. The other, I grew up with my grandparents um, after my mom passed away when I was very young, and they taught me the most important thing was to be kind. And so Mother Teresa also, the three most important things in life are, first is to be kind, second is to be kind, and third is to be kind. So not only is that in terms of how we engage local communities, but how do we engage each other during this very difficult time? And so important to, to appreciate that there are battles going on both on the personal, but also on the global and community level. And let's have a little bit more kindness as we do that to listen and learn and then innovate. And then finally, something which I've also learned uh, through my own mentorship at the school was the idea that people forget what you said and people forget what you did but people will never forget how you made them feel by Maya Angelou. And again, I think, at least in my humble opinion, it's all about listening and learning from each other. And I do believe that for us as a global community of alumni, whether it's using our imagination, being kind and treating people respectfully as part of this ecosystem to reimagine our better tomorrow, well, I feel blessed I've had this time with you and I do hope that we'll have a chance to connect and discuss this more. Thank you so much. It's been a true privilege and honor. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's been great hearing about your work and thank you for taking your time to share it with us. Question for you. Uh, just, well, first, going back to your Einstein quote about imagination will get you everywhere. What do you think um, the public health community needs or what have you covered in your um, presentation that could help the public health community think more innovatively on how to address these dueling pandemics? You know, um, Jennifer, thank you so much for that question. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to discuss that. And so as you mentioned very on in my bio, I mean, I, I'm a big believer. I, I stir and mix the Kool-Aid on the value of public-private partnership. And I truly believe in a lot of cases, we've only scratched the surface in certain areas. So for example, you may recall, I believe it was last summer or maybe two summers ago, that it seems the, the days and years are now blending together. There was a big, uh, there's an article, I think it was front page of Washington Post around re rethinking the corporation and it was the council I think of CEOs and talked about we need to go beyond the traditional shareholder maxim but really look at stakeholder and I say this because there's an uh, it's not that it's necessarily evolving but I think it's had more substance recently around what they call these ESG or socially conscious impactful investments and we know there's um, all sorts of talk now of, and, and there are multiple exchanges around the globe that have valuations of in the trillions of looking at perhaps how we can think a little bit differently. So for example, supply chain, delivering, whether it's you know, HIV, you know, uh, antiretrovirals, are there ways of engaging the private sector in a way where perhaps it becomes a model that's sustained not just through uh, foundation and, and public, but how does the private sector see this as possibly a really important social impactful investment that we could do together. 
And I think one other example, of course, as we look forward to really conquering and beating this latest challenge, which is the COVID pandemic, is again, I feel very much the same, that the solutions aren't about just one partner or one type of partner, public or private, or, I mean, again, it's involving the clients, it's involving the local communities of how we not only design our, our vaccines, but how do we design those distribution networks so that those who need it most actually have access to them. So again, I wanna thank you for that question. It's, it's really where my heart is and where I see this uh, going in the future as well. Well, thank you for your thought provoking response. This concludes our lightning talk with Dr. Jeffrey Blander. Please, if you have time, we encourage you to check out some of the other lightning talks for this alumni weekend. Take care.